My name is Matthew Day, and I'm from Silverton. My name is Emily Foster, and I'm from Salem. I'm Daniel Parks from Portland. I'm Alex Pratt, I'm from Eugene. My name is Kelsey Popovich, and I'm from Salem. It's going to be their Willamette Valley. And although they live up to 150 miles from each other, they seem to understand their lives are linked. My name is Josh Finelli, and I'm from Salem. I'm Nasheed Waters from Portland. I'm Kalinda Harris, I'm from Eugene. I'm Krista Ingeretsen from Portland. Their future will be shaped by the health of America's 10th largest river. If the Willamette declines, so could their economy and their quality of life. They seem to sense this and to know many of the reasons. We have to take care of the river so we can use the water for our benefit. As the population in our area grows, we're going to need more water. I hope that people understand that pollution in streams is not just people dumping their oil into a stream. It also is affected by land use practices and soil that goes into streams. There are a lot of things that go on upstream that affect us here. Upstream there are farms. If a farmer puts fertilizer on his farm, it rains, the fertilizer washes into the stream. They wash down, they wash down the stream, it, it ends up here. Why? do kids in the Willamette River Basin sound so serious? What kind of frog is it? It's a tree frog. Maybe it's because they're learning, hands-on, about big problems they're inheriting from us. Portland, kids from Chief Joseph Elementary are putting in native plants. They hope the vegetation will filter pollution, washing into Columbia Slough from Portland International Raceway. That's over there and it's going into a slough. It's oil from the car tracks, garbage, and cigarette bugs. Corvallis, a student from Crescent Valley High School is taking precise measurements of groundwater. Alex Newport Barra calls it the river flowing beneath our feet. He's only 16 years old, but he understands chemicals we put on the land often wind up in water and fish and wildlife, and he's determined to learn more. Because the river is kind of, um, sh it's, it's a sign of what's to come. Salem, kids from the Abiquah School are putting up homes for wrens and swallows and the western bluebird, which is now considered a vulnerable species. The kids have learned why their help is needed. Previous generations of Willamette Valley residents cut down and plowed up too many natural bird homes. Results are becoming ominous. Oregon State bird, the western meadowlark, no longer sings in this valley where it used to be abundant. This group of adults has been studying the problems we're passing on to our children. The task force looked at the, at the whole basin, at the whole watershed. At the request of Governor Kitzhaber, they spent a year and a half on their research. City officials, environmentalists, academics, representatives for industry and agriculture. Among their findings, the state seldom checks water quality at swimming areas. There's no good system for telling the public if it's safe to be in the water. Same thing with eating fish from the Willamette. Some fish are not safe to eat as part of a regular diet, but the task force found that message is not getting through to most people. We found out that... The group is also emphasizing how much we've altered the landscape. We've wiped out most of the floodplain forest that once was up to seven miles wide. Clearing trees, draining wetlands, and turning a braided Willamette into a single ditch, we've destroyed a huge amount of wildlife habitat and created other big problems. Farmland as flat as a pool table cannot slow down floodwaters or hold them back, nor can it stop fertilizers or pesticides from washing into the river. And while it's true pollution was far more blatant in the past, while scenes like these have mostly been eliminated, the task force cautions less obvious pollution is flowing bit by bit from many more sources now. It will be much harder to control. Red flags, like deformed fish and species slipping closer to extinction, indicate we're pushing nature way too far. I mean, it's not just for other species and other plants and animals, it's also for ourselves. It's not the first time kids have pushed residents of the Willamette Valley to pay attention to their environment. October 1936, an opinion piece in the Oregonian points out at least six cases of typhoid have been traced directly to swimming in the Willamette or Columbia Slough. Suddenly, the splashing stops. 
the city's Board of Health has banned swimming. Kids now have a personal interest in demanding cleaner rivers. In 1938, they hold this rally outside Portland City Hall. In the same year, the president of a citizens group called the Oregon Wildlife Federation is using a new innovation called color film to document the Willamette's filthy condition. Pollution spews from industries and pours from city sewers. In 1938, there is no treatment. From a makeshift lab in the back of their vehicle, scientists test the water. They also take live and vigorous fish and place them in various portions of the Willamette. Using a clock, they watch how long it takes the fish to die. In some stretches, it only takes minutes. Oregon voters streamed to the polls in 1938, and by a three to one margin, they passed the Water Purification and Prevention of Pollution Bill. But as pollution controls are being put in place, World War II breaks out, and the cleanup effort stalls. Then in the 50s and early 60s, the Willamette Valley's population takes off. Industry booms. The volume of pollution increases, canceling out advances in treatment. By 1962, some people are calling the Willamette the dirtiest major river in the Pacific Northwest. But the next 10 years would see an amazing turnaround. Oregon would become famous for its environmentalism. Where these wastes are not treated in a safe manner, the affluent becomes an oxygen-gulping, slime-making scourge. KGW's Tom McCall produced a documentary called Pollution in Paradise, exposing the Willamette's dreadful condition. Actually had its first stirrings. Four years later, in 1966, McCall campaigned for governor, calling for stricter pollution laws and a cleaner Willamette. McCall won, and he followed through. Six years later, in 1972, National Geographic pronounced the Willamette a river restored. Boats crowded onto the river again. Anglers caught giant salmon. The water sparkled. Families beamed. And so did McCall. But remarkable as that cleanup was, we now realize it was limited. Industries along the river were forced to scale way back what they dumped. And cities were required to do far more treatment of their sewage. But today, the challenges confronting Willamette Valley residents are far more complex. When I think about my future, I think of how much less wildlife there will be. What a troubling contrast. The thrill of wildlife hey, the beaver. <laughs> and the sadness and worry in a young girl's voice. Is she right? Are we heading for a future with less wildlife? Boy, who's a, who's a bulb expert here? What side goes down oh, in this one? Last December, right Governor Kitzhaber assisted in a hopeful project. Kids planted native trees and bulbs at Shampooey State Park to create more wildlife habitat. We felt the state needed to but get But just minutes earlier, Kitzhaber had received a disturbing report. Fittingly, he received it in front of Oregon's early settlers. The report detailed how drastically these pioneers and all the generations since have altered the Willamette Basin's landscape. For timber, for farmland, for cities, Willamette Basin residents have been clearing forests and draining wetlands and shrinking their natural inheritance. For the next generation, this is all that's left. 28% of the original bottomland forests. 13% of the wetlands and plant communities found around water, and only 1% of the native grasslands remain. Making matters worse are the plants we've introduced, English ivy and Himalayan blackberries, just to name two. Exotic plants are spreading so thickly, they're choking out native plants, like snowberries, that offer better food sources for wildlife. With less to eat and fewer places to live, Fish and wildlife are also under attack from chemicals that wash from our altered landscape into streams and rivers. Scientists are finding fish eaten away by disease. Some have badly deformed backbones. Others have undeveloped eyes and strange lesions. And there are species like steelhead, bull trout, the western bluebird, and the meadowlark that are becoming so scarce, the little girl's fear of an impoverished future seems to be coming true already. Yet from Eugene to Portland, we're continuing to wipe out more habitat. A 1997 study found we've drained and filled, just in the last decade, 11 square miles of wetlands. Can anything be done? First and foremost, we recommend that the state
take a leadership role and lead by example in managing our common resources. The state could begin turning farmland like this into forest and wetland habitat. This cornfield is just a small portion of thousands of acres near the Willamette owned by the State Parks Department. Instead of leasing public land to farmers, the Parks Department could, if it chooses to, reestablish some of the natural vegetation we've lost in the Willamette Basin. A soft rain is beginning to fall in the Willamette Valley as an egret checks for potential threats. Other birds are busy bathing and searching for food. The rain becomes steadier, bigger drops making the stream jump and bubble. Suddenly, the wildlife has company. A flotilla of cigarette butts has entered the stream from nearby storm drains. Just another rainy day at Beaverton Creek where scientists are finding a lot more than cigarette butts downstream from an expanding sea of asphalt. Yes, residential, commercial, and industrial development is taking its toll on water quality. It's not just a farm agricultural issue. He's referring to fertilizers and pesticides. It's easy to point a finger at farms where chemicals are applied not only in much bigger quantities, but with all the subtlety of a crop sprayer banking over Interstate 5 as it lines up to drop another swath of chemicals right next to the freeway. But for hundreds of thousands of Willamette Valley residents, Dursban, Diazinon, Casseron are household words. And these chemicals, designed to kill weeds and insects and capable of killing fish, are not staying in people's lawns and gardens. One good rain, and they're washing towards the nearest stream. Chauncey Anderson of the U.S. Geological Survey knows because he tested Beaverton Creek and found in the water malathion, diazinon, atrazine, and a dozen other pesticides. City officials charged with keeping our streams and rivers healthy are worried. They're afraid too many consumers are reaching for lawn and garden chemicals, not with a profound sense of responsibility, but with a quick fix mindset. I use this amount, it will kill those weeds and my lawn will look better. If I use a little bit more, it will make sure those weeds get killed. That's not the case. That extra pesticide that you might use on your lawn, it, it will simply run off when it rains and it ends up in the river. Hoping to persuade Willamette Valley residents water quality is their responsibility, Portland, Eugene, Corvallis, and Salem have pooled their resources to put this message on television sometime during the next five months. You're traveling at 300 miles a minute. There's Corvallis. Coming up on the left is Albany. Salem will be the next city on the right. Part of that is, is to just grab people's attention. It's a way to bring everybody together as you're going on downriver. This is a spot that just is there to grab people and say, oh yeah, I can do something to help that. The cities are hoping people will see a phone number at the end of the spot and call to get a free packet of information on how they can help protect water quality. Now, agriculture. In his search for pesticides, Chauncey Anderson sampled 16 streams meandering through farmland. His most alarming finding came here. South of Dayton, this is the West Fork of Palmer Creek. In this little basin, farmers grow some 18 different crops. Downstream, Anderson found 24 different pesticides in the water. One insecticide ingredient called chlorpyrifos was in the stream in a shocking concentration. Scientists have determined how much chlorpyrifos it would take to kill something like a snail or even a fish in just one hour. In the West Fork of Palmer Creek, chlorpyrifos levels were 40 times higher. And it is worrisome. I mean, um, that is an extremely high level. Whatever we could do to correct that problem, I'm sure, you know, we'd want to be involved in that. Sam Sweeney farms in the area. He told us he's perplexed by the discovery and questions it because farmers around the West Fork of Palmer Creek are not farming any differently than growers in other parts of the Willamette Basin. My family has been farming in the state of Oregon for 112 years. But many growers are acknowledging there is more farmers can and should do to keep soil and pesticides out of streams. We're in the process now of, of really planting back native species, um, planting back trees. Last month, surprised Portlanders stopped their grocery shopping to listen to farmers and the governor 
Talk about agricultural success stories like this one. It's the Sokol Blosser Vineyard in Yamhill County, where they grow grass between rows of vines. The grass holds soil in place so it won't muddy streams and suffocate eggs laid by salmon. An environmental group inspected the vineyard, liked what it saw, and is now telling consumers if you buy this wine and these other salmon-safe products, you'll be helping farmers who are trying hard to help the environment. And it also gives urban dwellers a tangible action they can take. The governor is happily endorsing the Salmon Safe campaign, calling it a good example of urban and rural residents working together for better water quality. Debate will continue about who the biggest culprits are in muddying and polluting our water. But where the Willamette finally dumps into the Columbia, we get this feedback vividly displayed in brown and blue. Stretching toward the Pacific in a muddy trail are the combined impacts from the entire Willamette Basin. Two million of us, urban and rural, leaving one ominous signature in the water we depend on. Football Saturday in Corvallis. Kickoff is just minutes away. Fans are going nuts. The coach is trying to stay focused on his game plan, and the Oregon State players are reaching out to touch something as they stream onto the field. It's the school's mascot. The real thing can be found just a mile or two from the stadium in the Willamette River. Like other cities north and south in the valley, Corvallis feels a deep bond with the Willamette. But there's a difference here. When players stream off the field at halftime to gulp down water in the locker room, it will be coming from the Corvallis treatment plant, which pumps this city's water right out of the Willamette. Even the mayor of Corvallis struggles to make this sound like an ideal source. Well, I don't really think that we have a choice. We are able to take about 35% of our drinking water uh, from Rock Creek, which comes out of the coast range, uh, and is cleaner and easier to treat. But we need to take, at the present time, 65% out of the Willamette and that percentage is going to grow as we grow, and I don't think we have other alternatives. This is where Corvallis sucks water from the Willamette and treats it, and here's how. First, river water is passed through rotating screens to take out leaves and sticks. Then a sticky chemical called aluminum sulfate is added to the water. The chemical puts positive and negative charges in the murky water, which encourages particles of silt and sand and leaves and fish excrement to grab onto each other. When clumps get big and heavy, they drop to the bottom of these tanks. Now free of the larger contaminants, water moves on through granular carbon and anthracite, which filters out smaller unpleasantries. Then lime is added to the water and soda ash to change the acidity of the water. Then a disinfectant called sodium hypochlorate is added to attack viruses and bacteria. When it's done, Corvallis has removed all of this from the water it began with. The city boasts what it sends to people's faucets is perfectly good drinking water meeting every federal health standard. So if Corvallis can do it, then why not cities like Tigard and Wilsonville? Wilsonville had to call a halt to growth because it doesn't have enough drinking water to send to more homes and businesses. Why not get more water from the Willamette? Right now, several Portland suburbs are exploring the possibility. Lisa Obermeyer is their lead scientist trying to answer two questions. What is in the river that can impact human health and how do we treat for that? My basic conclusion and what I feel comfortable saying as a water treatment scientist is that the Willamette River can produce a very high quality, safe source of drinking water for the region. She cites two reasons. Number one, despite what people hear about overflowing sewers and chemicals running off farms and lawns in the cities, the Willamette's water quality is much better than the national average for surface water. And number two, treatment technology has gotten even better. It might take 50 or 100 or 150 years to get the Willamette River so that it's clean enough to drink. Many Willamette Valley residents remain skeptical. And here are two major reasons. First, while Corvallis appears to be relying successfully on the Willamette, a huge amount of pollution gets into the river after it passes Corvallis. By the time the river reaches the Portland area, it carries far more pollution that would have to be treated. Secondly, what about all those fish with badly deformed backbones that turned up in the Willamette's Newburgh pool? My understanding is that to date they haven't been able to identify a specific 
uh, agent that is causing that. It's been a year and a half since the governor correctly stated scientists don't know why the Willamette has so many deformed fish, and they still don't know. Many people get nervous at this idea. If something in the water is causing this, and we can't even put our finger on what, how can we be sure we're eliminating that threat when we turn river water into drinking water? Even treatment expert Lisa Obermeyer, who could have given us reassurances and nothing more, mentions this concern. Runoff from agricultural lands. Chemicals washing from farms strike her as the greatest threat. She's talking strictly as a scientist who knows what's involved in treating river water so it's safe to drink. Upstream of where I'm concerned about, which is the Wilsonville area, upstream of Wilsonville, the primary load is coming from the tributaries that pass through agricultural land. From a drinking water perspective, Obermeyer says she'd be in favor of any enforcement or incentives that would keep more farm chemicals out of the Willamette. A farmer took these pictures two winters ago as he discovered what was happening to his land. Yeah, the river's trying to cut a new channel through there. Yeah. The Willamette was shifting course, ripping a shortcut through prime soil that produces beans and corn and squash. It happened at this sweeping bend in the Willamette south of Dayton. The river cut straight across its own curve and will again someday. Russell May has decided it's the river's will and he can't fight it. It's kind of hard to stop the power of the river. May is pointing out for us where the Willamette's main channel may be someday. The river appears determined to shortcut across his land. Surprised? Most people today tend to think of the river as being pretty much in the same spot most of the time. That's false, according to University of Oregon researcher David Hulse. We're looking at the position of each of these rivers in 1996. Look closely at the rivers on his computer monitor. Here they are again. The Sandiam coming down from the Cascades, joining the Willamette. 1850. With computer animation, researchers can now show us how the river channel shifts over time. 1895. As the U.S. enters World War I and the Depression, the Willamette is moving again and splitting into two channels. 1932. History winds up showing us there's a broad zone where we can try farming or building, but the river will eventually claim that land again and the total active channel. So getting back to today's Willamette, here's the point. Land on either side of the current channel may seem ideal for farming or for building a home, but history tells us we would only be borrowing the land until the river flooded it or carved it away. So why are cities and counties still allowing people to build in the floodplain? Have we forgotten the great flood already? Just two years ago, we witnessed people nearly killed, homeowners having to evacuate, Entire neighborhoods losing their battle with rising water. An exhausting emergency seemed to involve everyone. That's those ones you wanted, right? right? Corvallis. One day this past winter, we asked a planner to run a computer check for us. We learned this office complex was rising where floodwaters may rise someday. And it's not alone. Residential, business, residential, residential, business residential, business. Correct. And all of these things are being built in the floodplain. Correct. Yes, they're taking some risk. The same thing is happening in the Portland area. Many homes in the floodplain were built a long time ago, but over a thousand have been built in the last six years. So we're just not getting it. We're just not getting it. We continue to build in the floodplain. Recommendations from the governor's task force. Number one, stop allowing people to build in harm's way. It's risky and it's a waste of scarce money to help victims rebuild if they're likely to be flooded again. Number two, like the kid says. Native plants help absorb the flood waters and stuff so it won't flood as much as it does right now. Think about this as you fly north near Independence. When the Willamette spilled over its banks in centuries past, forests and wetlands trapped the flood waters and held them. Gradually, the water would drain back into the river, but not all at once in a giant downstream surge. But farming and everything else that's turned the floodplain as smooth as a desktop has taken away the storage areas like the two marshes you see ahead. Farm fields can't hold water like forests or wetlands. Instead of putting the brakes on a flood, farm fields often simply add silt and chemicals to the water. 
So the task force recommends more efforts like this one in Corvallis, where kids are working to reestablish a floodplain forest. A third recommendation is to identify landowners like Russell May, who may be willing to turn some of their fertile but flood-prone acreage back to nature. Right now, the federal government is working on just such a deal with May. Uncle Sam would use your tax dollars, paying May not to farm. The government would plant trees instead, and Lambert Bend would be turned back into the forested wetland May's grandfather cleared 60 years ago. Not an easy choice for May. This is some of the best farmland you can have, and they just don't make farmland anymore. You're not allowed to really clear much land anymore, and what farmland there is around the edge of cities is all being taken up by houses. Clearly, the idea of converting farmland back into floodplain forest will not be an easy sell. As the first European settlers began changing the Willamette Valley, some of them wondered what a distant future might look like. At first, their homes stood alone in the wilderness. But as they multiplied, riverbanks began to look less wild. And when pioneers pushed the forest back to make room for crops and for homes, they acknowledged with names like Stumptown, they were not treading lightly on the land. Some of them even tried to imagine how much human population this new land could handle. And in fact, a, a pioneer once wrote back to his hometown newspaper that there was room for at least 500,000 more people in Oregon. <laughs> we now have over two million in the valley alone. Today, we not only have two million people living in the Willamette Basin, we have fierce debates about loss of farmland, depletion of our public forests, where city sprawl should stop, and where we can turn next for more drinking water. Former Governor Tom McCall was clearly anticipating the environmental headaches when he made the legendary remark he would have to explain for the rest of his life. What I did say was a much more friendly thing. I've said it many times. I welcome visitors. I urge them to come and come many, many times to enjoy the beauties of Oregon. But I also urge them, for heaven's sake, don't move here to live. That's what I actually said. <laughs> From McCall's time, when traffic was still sparse, we've added 500,000 people, not just crowding into Portland, but into Eugene, where they're struggling to balance new jobs with destruction of wetlands. Into Corvallis, where the city will be sucking more drinking water from a river giving us warnings we don't understand. And into Salem, where legislators and the governor must wrestle with the increasing pressure that population puts on everything from wildlife to water quality to human health. In the next 25 to 30 years, the Willamette Valley's population is expected to double. Look at her feet. This may help. At the University of Oregon and Oregon State University, researchers are creating what they call possible futures. With projections of population growth, they're plotting future homes and other changes on the landscape a quarter of an acre at a time. These uh, decisions that get made about how we use land. For David Hull says it will actually be possible to tell decision makers what impact will result from different levels of growth. If we can anticipate our impact on water quality, wildlife habitat, threatened species, and more, then we can choose how much impact we're willing to have instead of discovering after it's too late. Can we do it? Can we pass on a Willamette Valley still beautiful, healthy, and full of promise? With our population soaring, some people might say the problems are now too big for any one of us to make a difference. If everybody had that same opinion, had that same outlook, um, we'd never get anything done. It takes a number of people. It takes a lot of people working together. The children see possibility and a simple reason why we should try. Not because you're saving water, not because you're saving yourself, not because you're saving animal species, just because it's nice to have and nice to be there. 
I know my dad took me to some places such as like Johnson Creek and told me some of his memories what he had with his father and maybe I might just want to do the same with my kids. people all over the Willamette Valley if they're if they're warned about what's happening and they're told what we could do to make a change I think they would do it and right now you are looking at the faces of the basin's future these students are here with us tonight in the Senate Chambers. Several area schools throughout the basin have been studying a special curriculum on the Willamette. We're going to speak with many of these students and as well, we will of course have much to, to talk about with the members of our audience this evening. And I would also like to tell you now that my colleagues are spread throughout the Senate Chambers. Joe Donlin, Larry Shoup, and John Catton, they're all here and they are ready to help lead in tonight's discussion. Besides that, if you would like more information at home, jot down this toll-free number. It is 1-888-854-8377. And we're gonna be sure to repeat this number throughout the next hour. We'll be back to talk about the issues after this word from our sponsor, PGE. This News Channel 8 special, The Willamette River Currents of Change, was sponsored by Portland General Electric, connecting people, power, and possibilities. Every time it rains, even a little bit, pollution from our neighborhoods washes into our rivers. That's why clean rivers start at home, and it's easy to do your part. Keep your driveway and sidewalk clean by sweeping instead of hosing them down. Perform regular maintenance on your car to prevent oil and coolant leaks. And put cigarette butts in their proper place, not on the ground. Portland General Electric urges you to save the drain for the rain because clean rivers start with you. The Northwest, the wonder of it all, stretches out in every direction farther than the eye or even the imagination can see. And every day, those of us who live here know wonder. And every day, News Channel 8 reports the who, what, when, and where how and why it matters to intelligent people who live here. You watch. You'll see. And now back to the Willamette River, Currents of Change. Welcome back to our Northwest News Channel 8 special, The Willamette River, Currents of Change. We have shown you some of the problems facing our basin. Now we have the opportunity tonight for positive dialogue. Once again, we need to emphasize that there's really no way we can expect to solve all of the basin's problems in just one evening, but we can certainly begin working toward cooperative solutions. This event has come about as a result of a report that was commissioned by Governor John Kitzhaber. It was a special group assigned by the governor to not only identify the problems in the basin, but to also suggest some solutions. The governor joins us now, and we're hoping that he is going to tell us why the Willamette River Basin is so important to the state of Oregon. Governor? Well, I think cleaning up the Willamette uh, has a number of uh, reasons why we need to do it. First, it's the right thing to do. I don't think anyone wants a polluted stream running through the heart of Oregon. A second, we need the water and the fish and wildlife that depend on it. We need water for irrigation, for municipal purposes, for industry, for recreation. But I think at the end of the day, the reason we need to clean up the Willamette River is because that is who we are. Uh, Oregon is still a state where the quality of people's lives to a great extent is created and defined and enhanced by the unique physical attributes of the place itself, including its rivers. And it's my hope that with the help of programs like this, will once again be able to strike that important balance between the legitimate claims of a growing population and the capacity of nature to accommodate them. Thank you, Governor. We also have several other important legislative leaders here with us tonight. I'd like to introduce to you now Senator Ted Ferrioli from Hood River, of course. Senator Ferrioli, you're involved with these issues. You know what they're about. What are you hoping might come out of this evening? Well, I think it's important that um, all Oregonians get an opportunity to understand that we we are not in denial about the issues and the problems that face all Oregonians. We understand there's opportunities, there are issues that are serious. All of us want clean water. All of us want healthy watersheds. 
resilient wildlife populations, recreational opportunities for our kids, and a future that we pass on that's healthy for those kids. Um, and we're all willing to work together. You know, we, we very often get frustrated in Oregon about uh, partisan politics and issues that seem to divide us. We're not divided about the need to have clean water. We're not divided about the issue of resilient ecosystems. So I'm hoping that what comes out of this evening uh, and this issue is partnerships that work across rural Oregon, across urban Oregon, uh, across those gulfs that seem to have divided us on other issues. So we really are hoping that uh, this is a handshake uh, across uh, uh, ideological, across uh, urban and rural, and across the aisles of our political system. Thank you very much, Thank Senator. You. Also, I would like to introduce to you another important man. He is, in fact, the chairman of the Willamette River Basin Task Force. His name is John Miller. Mr. Miller. Thank you, Carol. The task force planted the seed for this evening over a year ago, and we are delighted that PGE and KGW have brought it to fruition in such a, an amazing way. Two years ago, the governor appointed our task force and directed us to come up with collaborative, practical solutions. And in that spirit, tonight, each of the task force members has put a blue ribbon on each chair in the chamber. The, the ribbon symbolizes many things. This is a blue ribbon event and group. Uh, it's the, the ribbon of the rivers is what ties us together as a community. But most importantly tonight, even if this ends up on your antenna, mm -hmm. think of it as a symbol, a reminder that these fingers are not for pointing at each other. They're for pointing towards collaborative and positive solutions in the future. And I want also to mention the fact that there are kids here from schools all over the basin, and some of them are inner city kids doing stream team restoration. Others are future farmers of America doing stream restoration as well. The task force found a lot of, of good in our common ground as well as our differences and I hope we can see where that path leads us tonight. Great, thank you so much. I'd also like to introduce now Sarah Vickerman. She's the Vice Chair of the Willamette River Basin Task Force and also the West Coast Director for Defenders of Wildlife. Sarah, welcome. And also seated next to Sarah is Phil Ward from the Oregon Farm Bureau. I would like to thank all of you for joining us this evening. These are five of our panelists, but we also have several more, another 11, in fact, invited experts. John Catton and Larry Shoup will introduce them to you now. Carol, I am uh, with Nina Bell right now, who is one of the panelists. She's an environmental attorney with Northwest Environmental Advocates. Next to Nina is Helen Berg. You saw her in John's documentary. She is the mayor of Corvallis. Next to Helen is Senator Gene Durfler. He is a Republican from Salem. Uh, Deborah Evans, next to the senator. She is from the city of Eugene. Uh, next to Deborah is Don Francis, the Willamette Riverkeeper, which is an advoc advocacy group that advocates only for the, for the Willamette River. And then uh, next to Don is Liz Hamilton with the Northwest Sports Fishermen Association, and that is an industry group. John? Larry, right next to me is uh, John Ledger, who lobbies on environmental issues for Associated Oregon Industries. As we move along, uh, Dennis Lynch with the uh, U.S. Geological Survey Water Resources Division. Next to him, Dr. Gary Oxman, the Multnomah County Health Officer. Moving along, Eric Sten, City Commissioner with the City of Portland. And next to him, Terry Witt, a uh, lobbyist for farmers uh, with the Oregonians for Food and Shelter. Carol? Thank you very much, John. A really quick correction here. Senator Ted Ferrioli, of course, is from John Day, not from Hood River. I apologize no. for the error. Um, we also have an invited audience as well. Of course, this night wouldn't be possible without some folks, as we said, from all around the basin to comment on these all-important issues. These people represent all facets of the basin, from government to agriculture, conservation to industry, and we will certainly hear from them as well. We'd like to begin tonight's discussion now with a question. And if I could ask for a show of hands, how many of you folks folks with us tonight would consider the Willamette River as a source of drinking water. Raise your hands. Okay. It's a pretty good show. How many of you would think that this really isn't a very good possibility? How many of you would shy away from that? This is obviously a very educated audience. <laughs> But obviously what the show of hands does represent to us is that there is a lot of concern about the Willamette, and certainly there are reasons why. As we fly over it now, take a good look at why some people would be hesitant to drink water out of this river. 
It's brown, murky water is definitely hard to get past. However, Portland and other cities may one day need to pull water from the river as demands on area reservoirs increase. We need to have alternatives, but the question tonight is, is the Willamette River a viable source for drinking water? Corvallis residents certainly say yes that it is. We heard that in John's documentary. The city is already, in fact, taking water from the river. Corvallis Mayor Helen Berg joins us tonight. And Mayor Berg, if you wouldn't mind standing, thank you very much. I'd like to start with a question to you now. Was it a last resort for the city of Corvallis to decide to go this route? Well, if it was a last resort, it was quite some time ago. We have been taking our drinking, some of our drinking water from the Willamette River since 1949. Taking two thirds of it from the river? About 60%, yes. Do you feel good about that decision? Do you hear complaints from people in the city who are concerned about it? Well, Corvallis's drinking water is absolutely safe for anyone to drink. And we meet uh, federal and state standards with respect to 120 contaminants for which we measure. Uh, and, and we do uh, maintain those standards, and we do something on the order of 3,000 tests of our drinking water a year. Do you think this is something that other cities should consider? Well, I think it's something other cities have to do in order to stay in compliance uh, with the Clean Drinking Water Act. Or do you mean taking water out of the river? Absolutely. Perhaps it depends on what sec segment of the river your city is at. We keep a keen eye on what comes downriver to us, and the uh, Department of Environmental Quality's evaluation is that the raw water in our segment of the river is of high quality. Okay. That's uh, direct from Mayor Helen Berg. You heard how she feels about her city taking water from the Willamette River. I'd like to ask a question of uh, Portland City Commissioner Eric Stinn now. Eric, you have um, made no bones about the fact that you'd like to keep Portland's water supply coming from Bull Run Reservoir. W would you consider taking water from the Willamette? Portland won't, but, but people in our region will have to. Uh, Portland is very lucky because we have the Bull Run. The Bull Run right now serves all Portlanders in about 40% of the suburbs. So. About half of Portland's water goes to the suburbs, half goes into the city of Portland. Uh, Portland will never be in the position of having to drink the Willamette because we were very lucky 100 years ago, people plan correctly and we can drink the Bull Run. It's my belief the whole Portland region can drink the Bull Run if it so chooses, but that's a decision that the suburbs have to make for themselves. In Corvallis's case, I don't think they have a choice. Uh, it's not a matter of the Willamette not being safe, in my opinion, but if you've got a better source of water, wouldn't you drink it? And the Bull Run is a better source. Hmm. Okay, John. I have a question for uh, Mike Houck of the Portland Audubon Society, if you don't mind standing up, Mike. This issue cuts both ways a lot of times in the environmental movement. Some people say uh, that there is a, a real value in uh, committing ourselves to the Willamette River because we'd be forced to take care of it. Well, I happen to be one of those people. I don't, I don't diminish the fact that there are concerns today, but in terms of leaving the Willamette River on the table for future consideration, I'm a strong advocate of that. And I think nothing will rivet people's attention more what they're doing to, the, to their drinking water, to the Willamette River, uh, than, than knowing that in another 30, 40 years they may be drinking from it. I have another question for uh, Terry Witt, a lobbyist for farmers with the Oregonians for Food and Shelter. Uh, we've heard uh, concern about the various things flowing in, and of course, the further you go down river, the more things have flowed in. Uh, and a lot of that is from agricultural land, just by, by acreage. Uh, you're, you're a big player. Uh, do you feel that, that farmers have a, a big responsibility in protecting the future drinking water possibilities of the Willamette, on top of the other things like fish and recreation? Well, I think farmers, like everyone else, have a big part to play in protecting our waters. Uh, much of, uh, of what uh, goes into the river is, is uh, as a result of man's activities, whether they're in the city or whether they're on a farm. And we're seeing a tremendous amount of research going into things we can do to stop soil erosion and stop movement of the pesticides and uh, fertilizers with soil into the river. I have a question for Governor Kitzhopper. Talking about not only Willamette River water, but also our groundwater supply, which of course supplies about a third of the basin's drinking water. But Governor, some of that in rural areas is contaminated. Oregon has a very good groundwater protection act, but it's not fully funded as far as the basin is concerned. Can you talk about that? 
Well, uh, money is, is, is obviously a part of this, not just for groundwater protection, for cleaning up surface water as well. But I think the choice, the fundamental choice we're faced with here is if we're going to use the Willamette for drinking water, there's two ways to do it. You can invest huge amounts of money in treatment plants, which Corvallis is doing, or you can get to the source and try to collaboratively figure out how to clean up the river from the, from the get-go. And that in includes groundwater, ag, forestry, and urbanites who really do have to step up to the plate and make a contribution themselves. We'll see whether or not that happens. Maybe tonight's discussion will lead some folks to indeed do that. Um, do we have any more questions from the audience, particularly about drinking water? Okay, we are going to move on now because when you talk about drinking water, you can't ignore water quality as a whole. This is really a whole nother subject, but it does touch on some of the more important facets of why we are here this evening. That includes the impact that rural and urban practices have on our basin. It's a delicate balance. Do we need laws when it comes to farm practices or are voluntary efforts making the difference? Should there be pesticide reporting laws? And who should shoulder the financial burden? Here's the News Channel's John Catton now with more on water quality. John? Carol, I have a question for uh, Nina Bell with Northwest Environmental Advocates. Uh, her group was uh, very much involved in, in suing the city of Portland and forcing ultimately this $700 million uh, solution to the chronic overflows of uh, sewer and stormwater uh, from, from the city of Portland. Nina, some people are saying that is such a huge chunk of money that it would be better spent further up river where people would uh, get the benefits of, of that for a greater stretch of the river than right there in Portland where it uh, quickly washes into the Columbia. What do you think about that? Well, we were told today not to point fingers, but pointing fingers is something that typically does go on on the Willamette River or the Columbia River where people downstream point upstream, people upstream point downstream and all of that kind of thing. Um, the important thing is that everybody and every entity, every industry, every source is responsible for cleaning up their portion of the pollution, regardless of whether it's an urban source or a rural source. And really, under the Clean Water Act that was passed over 25 years ago, regardless of the cost of cleanup. The important thing right now is that we have leadership in this state at, that does not hide behind task forces and commissions and councils and committees that implements with every law that we have available to us through the Federal Clean Water Act, through all the state laws and local ordinances to implement the laws that require that all unsafe levels of pollution in the Willamette River Basin and elsewhere in the state are cleaned up. And that's a commitment that this state needs to honor. Thank you very much. Nina Bell with Northwest Environmental Advocates. Joe Donlin? We have a question here. Yes, my name is Neva Hassanen. I'm with the Northwest Coalition for Alternatives to Pesticides. And I just want to suggest that one of the solutions that we can pursue here in Oregon with respect to pesticide pollution is to begin to keep track of what pesticides we use. We have no way of knowing right now what pesticides are used where, when, and in what amounts. This kind of uh, approach of collecting pesticide use information could really take us a long way towards solving some of the pesticide pollution problems. I have a follow-up on that that I'd like to address to uh, Phil Ward of the Oregon Farm Bureau. Uh, Phil, it uh, just came out with the U.S. Geological Survey a study of these 20 different streams that uh, a lot of pesticides were found in a lot of those streams, both in, in rural and urban areas. But let's talk about the example of uh, that, that huge amount of uh, chlorpyrifos, an insecticide ingredient that was found there south of Dayton in the West Fork of Palmer Creek. The fact of the matter is, when they find that and they want to knock on doors and say, hey, you may have a problem in farm practices that's resulting in this in the water, they don't know where to knock, do they? Because there is no pesticide reporting that would lead them to somebody. Well, that's true, John, and, and certainly that's something that, that can be considered. I think the um, mechanics of a system that would be effective in that regard are certainly challenging. but but. Well, certainly you've, you've got to put a mechanism together that would accurately show you where the pesticides were used. And that would just take a lot of manpower and a lot of labor to do that. And uh, certainly agriculture, pesticides are just a tool. And if you don't use a tool correctly, then you're going to hurt yourself. And agriculture, I think, is in the business of using its tools correctly. Where that's not happening, we all want to get to the root of what that problem is. Carol? Yeah, I have a question for Bruce Andrews, D Director of the Department of Agriculture. What do you say, Bruce? Should we require pesticide reporting? <laughs> <laughs> I know this is a setup, right? <laughs> uh, what we should do is make sure that the chemicals that we do use, we use responsibly. 
Number one is we do require farmers to keep track of restricted use chemicals. But it's not only farmers, it's that we want to keep track of what happens in urban and suburban areas as well. This is not a single dimensional issue. The real thing is, is that we who have the most options in the future are going to be able to spread those decisions in a long time and, and make the kind of uh, uh, investment decisions that we want to make in the future. So if we concentrate on using what we have correctly, both either on the farm or in the urban or suburban area, the better off we're all going to be. Okay. Thank you, Bruce. We should underscore that uh, this recent study did show a lot of pesticides in the urban streams as well. So we just talked to the Farm Bureau and to the State Department of Agriculture, but it is very much an issue mm -hmm. uh, that the urban residents have to take seriously too in terms of what they're putting on their lawns. Carol? Certainly a mix here. The Willamette has become unsafe at times to play in. Recreation is one of the major uses of this river. Kids love to take the plunge during the warm summer months. But year after year, there are warnings that people can get sick from accidentally ingesting the water. More evidence of the river's poor health. Fish that have been found with legions and deformities. And again, we're told not to eat the fish out of the Willamette River. But is this message getting out? And who's responsible for checking to make sure that this message is in fact indeed being heard? For more on this topic, we go now to Joe Donlin. Joe? Thank you, Carol. We have another question for everyone, another show of hands. Who would be comfortable swimming in the Willamette? Understanding that when we get a pretty good rain, the sewer system dumps raw human waste into the Willamette. Still interested in swimming? Who would be worried about swimming in the Willamette? How about eating a fish that you caught out of the Willamette? Who would be happy to do that? I don't see one. There's one, two, three in the back. Let's go to uh, Dr. Gary Oxman, if we could. Doctor, what are the risks? The risks of, um, of the Willamette are really hard to quantify. The river clearly has pollution, and I think the question is not so much what are the risks, but what can we do to improve those risks, and also what alternatives do we have? Um, do we have to take our drinking water from the Willamette? Do we have other choices? Do we have to take our fish from the Willamette? Do we have other choices? Are there alternatives for recreation? So in, in this context of trying to clean up, we need to make sure that we also keep our choices clear, not panic but try to keep a level head about things. Do people know, in your opinion, are they aware of the situation? Aware of which The situation? dangers. The dangers? In no, I don't think people are aware of the dangers. I think, it's very, I think those dangers are very difficult to understand. People, many people will underestimate them, and many people will overestimate them. And frankly, I don't think from a scientific perspective we can tell you exactly what those dangers are. There are populations in Portland that eat quite a bit of fish out of the Willamette. It's part of the, a staple in their diet. What do you suggest we do to make people more aware of it? I think that really comes down to the issues of what specific fish are being eaten, where they're caught, what the conditions are, how they're prepared. I think, for example, some of the work done on the Columbia Slough really points out some good work with that, where people are being made aware of the risks, but again, they're not huge risks. They're risks that individuals and families need to choose to minimize by proper cooking, selecting the right species to eat, selecting the right parts of the fish to eat. Thank you very much, Dr. Gary Oxman. Follow-up question for Don Francis with the uh, Northwest Environmental Advocates. Uh, Don, my question Willamette to you. Willamette Riverkeeper. Uh, what, I'm Willamette sorry. Willamette Riverkeeper. <laughs> I beg your Formerly pardon. Formerly Northwest Formerly. Environmental Advocates. <laughs> Willamette Riverkeeper. Don, my question is uh, about how much we, we do know. I mean, the, the Oregon Health Division is quick to say some species, some river miles. We just can't tell you if that fish is safe to eat. But there's so much clouding fish in general. Should there be just a, a general warning uh, saying there's a lot we don't know? take that into account when you go down to fish? Well, first of all, the Oregon Health Division has issued a warning based on mercury for eating, uh, for advising people not to eat too much Willamette River fish. In addition to that, there's a whole host of other chemicals, uh, PCBs, DDT, dioxin, and other compounds in Willamette River fish. And the, the Oregon DEQ actually did a study where they took out hepatitis a snapshot. It's not a definitive study, but what it shows is that the fish in the Willamette River have very, very high levels above EPA standards of contaminants. And there are people who are, who are eating fish out of the Willamette River every day for sustenance, and they don't know about the dangers. Thank you. Carol? We have a pediatrician here in our audience, uh, Bob Heffernan from Portland. Bob, I'd like to ask you, do you think that the state is doing a good enough job of notifying the medical care industry about problems with the fish coming out of the Willamette? Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate being asked. I, I am not a water quality scientist. 
I feel that my patients are unaware many times of dangers of swimming in the Willamette River. And I think that that is something that we do have a duty to our pediatric population. Uh, I care for kids and I think uh, I, I want to say to my patients and my grandchildren that we did what we could on the watch for the Willamette River and I think we can do a lot more. So I would be in favor of investigating what dangers are in eating or swimming and to let people know in the river and let them make their own call. Thank you very much, Doctor. Carol? Thank you, John. There's no doubt that growth has certainly played a big role in the basin, a huge role, actually. And because of so much growth, it has caused many, many problems. Every 15 minutes, somebody new is moving into this state. But how much can our natural resources take? Should there be limits on growth altogether? And who should pay? Should growth foot the bill for environmental damage? Here's Larry Shoup now with more on our growing population. Thank you, Carol. And, and the numbers are indeed staggering. John talked about them a little bit in his documentary. But more than 2 million people in the Willamette River Basin right now. Within 30 years, 2 million more people in the Willamette River Basin. And that is an incredible number. I'd like to talk to, if I could, David Hulse. Could you stand up for us, David? I know that you were in the documentary and you have talked with John before. You do research down at the University of Oregon about population impacts. Where are these people going to go? I think that's a very important question. One of the things we've seen in uh, trying to do fairly careful reconstructions of population patterns uh, at a number of key moments in history, 1850, 1930, 1970, 1990, is that some of the legislative tools that were introduced in the early 1970s have had a big effect on clustering populations into more denser patterns. And actually, there have been many benefits from that, an expansion of uh, land available for agricultural uses, a number of environmental cleanup benefits that John's documentary reported on. Uh, we have a number of choices in front of us. Uh, we certainly can be proud of those gains we've made over the last 25, 30 years. But it's not clear to me whether or not those tools are going to be up to the task of accommodating the population growth that you mentioned. If we could right now, I'd like to bring some of the uh teenagers that came in as, and were very much a part of John's documentary. Uh, you are Chris Paul. You're the state treasurer for the Future Farmers of America. Yes, I am. What, what, what is your thought about population? What do you think about when you see us growing at that, at that rate? Two million more people. Two million more people. That's a, that's a, that's a large number of people. Um, not only are we having two more million people that are going to be um, uh, increasing the awareness of our river, but we have two million more people to mouths to feed in an agricultural standpoint here. Um, most people don't see these benefits of, we can have a strong economy and a strong environment, but we have to work at it. And people always think of it, we can have either or. But in the FFA, we know that we can have strong economy and a healthy environment. And agriculture education does work at that. Okay, thank you, Chris. I'd also like to bring Nina Bell in, if I could, because, uh, Nina, I I'm wondering from your standpoint with Northwest Environmental Advocates, what do you see as the impact of two million more people in our watershed? Well, obviously, there are lots of impacts, um, land use and um, transportation and all those kinds of things. But one of the things that I think we're not ready for is how to plan so that the growth that does occur and occurs in the way that our land use planning um, makes it uh, occur is also done in a way that does not worsen the water quality problems that we already have. And we're really not prepared for that um, at this moment in terms of the way our regulatory mechanisms work. Um, that's going to be a critical issue for, for now and in the near term. Okay, thank you, Nina. I think Joe Donlan has somebody up in the gallery. I do. Joe, you have a question? Yeah, I was kind of curious. It seems to be that one of the things that we've done so far in the discussion today is, is limit our, our vision of the basin to primarily the Willamette main stem. It seems to me that we should be talking about population growth also in McMinnville and say some of the outlying communities as well that affect the river quality as well. Um, I would like to bring quickly, we only have about a minute left on this topic. Uh, Deborah Evans is with the city of Eugene. Um, we get a lot of attention on Portland and Mr. Eric Sten's part of the world because of the growth up there. You're growing too. What can you do about it? Well, we've been doing a lot of planning. We've uh, recently conducted a growth management study and looked at our patterns of development. We've uh, adopted a stormwater management plan that addresses not only um, drainage issues but also water quality 
and natural resources. And I think Mike Howe coined the term green infrastructure, and that's a very essential element in a livable community, and we want to be able to protect that in Eugene. A comprehensive plan. Thank you very much, Deborah. Carol, back to you. Thanks, Larry. Well, we've been talking about how much we've been using the land. Indeed, our history of using the land has burdened the Willamette River Basin. You can see just what we're talking about. We have altered the landscape, literally. But in some places, it's to the detriment of the Willamette River Basin. For instance, what you see is an example of a floodplain forest. It helps hold in the river when it's tempted to overflow. The trees and natural ve vegetation also help filter out some of the chemicals that tend to wash from the fields into the river. But these natural barriers have been reduced. In some places, fields now go right up to the riverbank. There are efforts underway to restore some of these floodplain forests. And here to talk a little bit more about that now, once again, the News Channel's John Catton. John? Carol, altered landscape is one of the things that you'll see in this very large report card that we have uh, blown up here. And uh, Rick Bastash with the Willamette Valley Livability Forum is going to talk to us about it. I think uh, you can see uh, that things like uh, fish consumption warnings that we've been talking about, wetland loss, species at risk are listed here. And then very dramatically down this side, you can see these unsatisfactory and satisfactory grades. Uh, what is this report card going to accomplish, Rick, as you, as you try to get it published in newspapers and give people feedback? Well, John, very simply, we keep track of what's important to us, whether it's the Dow Jones Industrial Average or our weight. And uh, the report card's aim is to get organized about keeping track of what's important to us tonight, the health of the Willamette Basin. And we want to do that by putting information on key uh, Willamette Basin issues simply but accurately in front of uh, the public and decision makers so that we can easily find out where we are and where in the landscape we need to go to get the kind of basin we want. Well, on landscape alteration, where are we on wetlands, for example, on here? Can you trace across from me, left to right? Uh, one element of landscape change has to do with our loss of wetlands. Since settlement about 150 years ago, we've lost nearly 90% of our wetland and streamside vegetation, which has really lent a different kind of uh, uh, characteristic to uh, the basin that we think we know. And you're saying flat out that's unsatisfactory? Unsatisfactory. Okay, thank you very much, Rick. Let me ask, if I could, uh, Sarah Vickerman of uh, Defenders of Wildlife up front uh, next to uh, uh, Carol and, and John Miller there. Uh, Sarah, if I could ask you about uh, the wetland loss. 87%, uh, he said. And, and the fact is, it's not just since 1850. Uh, it's um, uh, 11 square miles in the Willamette Valley of wetlands that have been lost in the last 10 years. Uh, I thought 10 years ago George Bush was campaigning for president saying no net loss of wetlands. What it, happened? It may have been a little late at that point. And we've not only destroyed that many wetlands, we've also destroyed the streamside vegetation and the floodplain areas that uh, could serve as natural storage to help reduce flood damage, to improve wildlife habitat, to help recover the endangered fish that we're looking at now. So the, one of the things the task force really did, I think, a good job of is look at integrated solutions. How can we get uh, the big bang for the buck by looking at these flood issues in an integrated way while looking at the fish habitat issues, looking at water quality issues? And in my view, the single most important thing we can do is make an investment as a, as a valley here, as a society, in the restoration of those wetlands and that uh, uh, streamside vegetation. Thank you very much, sir. I've got a question, if I could, for uh, Terry Witt, again, a lobbyist for farmers. Uh, so much of the uh, landscape alteration that we've, we've talked about is uh, in the agricultural areas, floodplain forest that's been cleared away, farming right up to the river. And a lot of people are talking about the great potential for returning that to a floodplain forest and getting all the benefits of wildlife and filtration of chemicals running from the land into the river. Are there a lot of farmers that are interested in that if they had the financial incentives? Well, that's, a, that's an answer I really don't know. I think we'd have to go talk to those landowners. Um, it's, a, it's a very important issue, obviously, but so is uh, producing the food and the fiber that we need to, uh, to sustain, sustain our, our state. And so uh, I would say that would be an individual issue that we have to deal with with those individual landowners. All right, Terry Webb, thank you very much. Uh, quickly, a question here for uh, Mike Halker. Mike, you've got something you yeah, want to say, apparently. Comment, Portland actually, Audubon Society. Yeah, a comment. Actually, I want to make it very clear. We're, we're extending our hand to the farm and ag community in the Portland metropolitan region. We are stepping up to the plate. And in fact, Metro, 24 cities and three counties in the Portland metro area have removed floodplains, all floodplains, 
all wetlands, all streams from the buildable lands inventory, and that is part of the urban green infrastructure we're trying to protect in the city, and, and we're holding the urban growth boundary to protect farm and forest land outside the UGB, the quid pro so quo. you're saying you're doing your part Absolutely. in the urban area, they need and to step up. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying they need to step up, I'm saying we all need to. I'm not trying to point the finger again, I'm just saying we're doing it. <laughs> Good for you. John, Let's excuse me, and... I have something oh, okay. that dovetails perfectly into what you were just saying, Mike. Bill Chambers, can we hear from you, please? You're a farmer that I understand you're mid project, you're midway through a project right now of replanting a riverbank. Yes, we are. We're trying to uh, put uh, natural barriers uh, on the river to keep having erosion. And instead of using rock, we're trying to use uh, biological controls. And, and we're interested in trying to get as much natural wildlife and uh, plants as we possibly can to um, where it's, it, it integrates well with the farms. And it's also important that not just on the floodplains are these uh, plants uh, in, in areas important, but it's throughout the whole basin, just ridge top to ridge top, controlling the, the water and making sure that it, it doesn't get to the, the main stem of the Wyoming too quickly. Thank you very much, Bill Chambers. Let's go up to the balcony and go down one. For a question. Yes, hello, my name is Stephen Carwan. I'm a private ag consultant, and I have a suggestion on how we can pay for the um, riparian zones. The microelectronics industry currently is the equivalent, the functional equivalent of the 13th largest city in Oregon in its usage of water. The requirements for that water have to be better than what they are for salmon. Now, last time I saw, they were using, they were using a lot of water, and they've got pretty high profits. Let's tap into that pool of money. They have to safeguard that water resource for the future. Why don't we get them to be involved in safeguarding that and helping to pay for some of these riparian zones? Topic, but we've got a lot of other topics. Carol. Boy, I tell you, that's already our dilemma for the evening, isn't it, John? So much to say, and we're trying to be as concise as we possibly can, but that's because we have a lot of information to impart. A couple of years ago, we found out what happens when we try to manipulate the flow of the Willamette River. The river indeed fights back. Let's take a look now at some of the flooding issues in the Willamette Basin. Who could forget 1996? The Willamette River and its tributaries spilled over. In Portland, people raced to build up the seawall along Waterfront Park. In other places, homes were completely underwater. While nature played the biggest part in this flooding, we also played a role as well by making the river flow through a very narrow passageway. Too narrow, in fact, for it to carry the amount of water that at that time was trying to flow through it. We go back to Joe Donlan now, who has more from the gallery here in the Senate Chambers. Joe? Thank you, Carol. We're going to talk in just a minute. I'd like to with Mike Smith, who is a builder. So if Mike, if you would stand up for us, we're going to ask you a question in just a second. But I'd like to begin with John Miller. If you could give us an idea of how much we talked about the wetlands, how about the forest lands along the river basin that have been depleted since its origin, John? You and I talked about that the other night, the amount of forest that's been depleted. Riverbank forest that's gone. Oh, uh, that was the 87 percent figure in terms of the deletion of both wetlands and, repair, and riparian forests. Okay. How, how much, to give people an idea, the difference between public land and private land? Along about 40% uh, of the basin is public and about 80 to 90% of the private land that's left is either ag or forestry and about 10% urban. Okay. Uh, Mike Smith, let me ask you, is there anything that keeps you from building in the floodplain right now? No, there isn't. People want to, if people want to build in there? What's that? If people want to build in there, uh, I mean, do you have an obligation, a legal obligation to let them know at least that it's in a floodplain? Absolutely. What are requirements of building in there then that people are not afraid of? Do you build a house up? Why are they doing it? Well, I don't happen to have any property in the floodplain. But from a home building standpoint, uh, people are not afraid of it? Is that your indication? Well, I think any uh, knowledgeable consumer would be afraid of building in a floodplain, and it ought not to be done. Okay. Then Let's why is it happening? I couldn't tell you. Let's go to Larry Shoup. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I'm with Chris Paul again with Future Farmers of America, and you had a question. Yes, I do. Um, I'm really active in agricultural education. Um, our organization has taken large steps in educating students across Oregon, as well as many other student organizations out there. Um, I've got a, I've got a uh, a feeling, a strong feeling, and I know that no, no matter what problem, big or small, whether it's flooding, water quality, these problems can be answered through education. This question is to Governor Kitzhaber. Um, if, uh, Governor, could you tell us how you're going to utilize tools such as agricultural education, the FFA, and student organizations represented here in solving this problem? 
Well, I think uh, FFA is a tremendous uh, uh, potential source of education for young people, but I think there are other models that we need to encourage as well. Uh, I saw some the, the students down in Eugene, about a thousand students have put together a project called A Tale of Two Rivers that's at the Oregon Museum of Natural History that really, really educates a very interactive educational opportunity on, the, on, on these very issues. And I think we're really underutilizing uh, FFA and our students in our uh, primary and secondary schools in Oregon to really move this message uh, throughout the basin. Governor Kitzhaber, I'd like to ask you something if I could. Uh, the builder even is saying it's inexplicable to him why we would continue to build in the floodplain. Your task force chairman, John Miller, used four words, as I recall, to talk about this phenomenon of people building in harm's way. He said, it's just plain dumb. So <laughs> are you prepared to start looking at a policy that would uh, prevent this from happening? People are shaking their heads every time we have a flood saying, why is this continuing to happen? Well, I think it's part of a larger issue. I think, yes, we do need to look at uh, zoning ordinances about building the floodplain on the edge of sand dunes on the coast uh, and, uh, and, uh, in, and in areas where uh, there's a high risk of forest fire. These are legitimate issues that we have to come to terms with increasingly as our population grows. Thank you very much, Governor. Larry Shoup. Yeah, I think if you'd like to stand, uh, your name. I'm Jeremy Hall. I'm a member of the Sanium Watershed Guardians. And one of the things that we haven't really talked about is the high elevation forests above the transient snow line that are being logged on public lands. And uh, one thing that I'd really like to see is especially in municipal watersheds and in, in areas that are vulnerable to flooding, protection for those high elevation forests that are on Forest Service and BLM lands. In fact, uh, Ward Armstrong, you were with uh, the Oregon Forest Industries Council. What is your response to his statement? Well, I think one area of the, um, of the basin that is receiving very good streamside protection is in the forest land, both uh, public and private. The requirements of state and federal law are very extensive and very strict and very severe. So there is a great deal of protection on forest uh, streamside banks. What types of things is the forest industry doing right now on its own to improve water in the Willamette River Basin? Well, there are a number of things. One, we're required to leave a lot of trees on either side of the stream. We're required to help provide larger trees. And we're doing, uh, of course, we, we're not allowed to harvest near the stream. We're not allowed to uh, come up next to the bank of the stream at all. And voluntarily, we're doing a lot to bring material into the stream to help fish habitat. That's one of the voluntary things that's very important. Okay. Ward Armstrong, thank you very much. Joe Donlin. We have another comment up here from the gallery. Go ahead. Ruth Koenig, Eugene, and uh, Eugene has a fairly vigorous program of restoration of wetlands, and my question is, are there other plans for restoration of wetlands throughout the basin? Anyone like to tackle that? I'm wondering if John Miller, the, uh, the task force chairman, would have any information on, on whether that, I mean, you pointed out in your task force report there have been 11 square miles of wetlands lost. Mm -hmm. uh, I see Sarah Beckham putting her hand up. Uh, are there things coming into place now to make sure that we don't continue to lose those wetlands that, that are nature's storm drain for all these floodwaters? I, I think there's several things. One of them is, as Bill Chambers is doing, there are many farmers that are replanting those forests along the wetlands. Um, Mike Smith, um, the builder who, who spoke briefly earlier, um, he built my house, and it's funny, he talks a lot on the job, but uh, uh, <laughs> Mike, Mike was builder of the year in Oregon, and I've watched him care for the riverbank that he lives on in a way that reflects a real pride in, in ownership as well as a real gentleness with the river. And I think, I think one of the things we need to do is figure out how to implement that attitude into our regulations. Thank you very much, John. It's time to move on now. We're going to talk about threatened species, which is something very important that we can't ignore when you talk about the Willamette River. The burden of our actions is truly seen when we talk about threatened species. All along the basin, tens of thousands of different wildlife depend on the river and watershed for survival. But we've all slowly depleted the natural habitat for these creatures. In fact, the best example of this is the state bird. It's a rarity to even hear the meadow lark sing in the valley. It is indeed one of the victims of the basin. Larry Shoup now with more on what we are in danger of losing. Larry? Let's move along quickly, and I'd, I'd like to go immediately to Sarah Vickerman if I can. And Sarah, I mentioned to you that I was stunned to find out that there are 50 species of plant and animals that are endangered or threatened in the Willamette River Basin. And I don't think people are aware of that. We hear of fish. We don't hear of the other things. Can you quickly name some of those? Well, the pileated woodpecker is one. I was kind of surprising. And the western gray squirrel 
is another, and perhaps some people don't know that we extirpated the wolf and the grizzly bear from the Willamette Basin years ago, and the Columbia white-tailed deer that used to be in this area is, is no longer here. Some other things like the western pond turtle and the Willamette Valley daisy, just a series of things. It's really interesting that the list isn't longer, actually, given the level of development in the basin, and it probably would be. We've probably lost a lot of things we never cataloged in the first place. Thank you, sir. Again, I think even though 50 is a lot to me, I would like to talk to some of the kids. Would any of the kids like to talk to me here about what you think about possibly not seeing a particular species of plant or animal in your lifetime, if you would stand up your name? Nicole Cook. I'm from Oregon State University. Um, I was also going to make a comment. He talked about um, the buffer zones with the trees not being able to be logged or taken out from the sides of the streams and I think a lot of times people just pay attention to the streams like maybe just with the fish or with the with the big fish populations and what about the small streams and the small sloughs and, and the microorganisms that live in those that are really important to our our river and when these streams are abused and the water's warmed up in these streams there's silt that, and it flows in and again affects the whole river so not just the birds and the fish but the microorganisms and okay thank you Nicole if I could ask you you are one of the youngest members Emily Spicer you're from Four Corners School in Salem are you concerned that you may never see certain animals or certain plants Yeah. you are what do you think about that I don't I don't know I don't want them all to be gone you'd like them there for you and your kids Thank you. Um, I'd also like to, is Jim Martin here somewhere? There's Jim. Um, he is the advisor for the Oregon, uh, for the Governor's Salmon Plan. And, and Jim, we've talked about the endangered steelhead, the, the salmon that may soon be. Uh, what does this tell us about the health of the Willamette River, River Basin in your estimation? Well, it, the, the lack of the ability of these wild self-sustaining stocks to sustain themselves and their, their continuous decline indicates that we've kind of broken the chain in some very fundamental ways. Uh, the fish are struggling to survive to kind of pick up the fragmented pieces and create a whole cycle, uh, but they're losing that struggle. Um, for example, we've built dams that disconnect the main stem from the tributaries, but the fish's life cycle used to involve both the tributaries. We've simplified the channel of the river where we used to have rich flood bottoms and side channels and sloughs. Well, now we've got a river that drains water very effectively, except on the biggest of floods. Those all have consequences for fish and wildlife populations. The lack of the bald eagle's ability to reproduce effectively tells us something about bioaccumulation of toxics. And not all the wildlife gets to eat treated, drink treated water. So, so we need to uh, reconnect the system and improve the health of the whole system if we want these self-sustaining populations to make it. Thank you, Jim, very much. John? Larry, gentlemen in the crowd with a comment here. Tom Wolf of Trout Unlimited. Tom? Yeah, one thing that wasn't mentioned, and I serve on the Twalton River Watershed Council, is we have a tool in the state and it's watershed councils, and it wasn't mentioned tonight that uh, these councils can be used to alleviate a lot of these problems and I just want to make sure that people understand that they're there, they're working very hard, but they are facing a problem with funding. Thank you very much, Tom. Larry? Was there another person over here who wanted to talk about what the loss of threatened species is going to mean to them? My name is Greg Stiles and my comment applies to everything and not just species loss. And in the case of the builder, the, there's no laws or regulations in place to control his actions and the laws that are in place, the regulation and even the voluntary approaches have basically proven, proven ineffective and what we need is economic discouragement. We need to tax those activities, the loss of wetlands, the loss of species and because our whole economic vitality is in the valley. And Greg, we're, we're out of time and I also think we need one heck of a lot of cooperation as well. Carol? Boy, it's difficult to say that we're out of time tonight because we have a room full of people with their hands up anxious to speak a lot more about the topics that we've discussed. However, why don't we just stop for a moment and take stock of so much that we have learned this evening. It's been a very quick hour and a half and we'd like to thank everybody who came tonight and who participated in our discussion. These people want to hear from you. We work together to help this precious resource. We've also learned that there are little things that you can do that will benefit the basin. 
For those of you at home and even those of you here, you can certainly get involved by calling this toll-free phone number. It is 1-888-854-8377. And with more on this now, I'd like to introduce Bridget Adolph. She has been a critical part of the Willamette River Basin Task Force for, gosh, the last one and a half to two years. Bridget? Thank you. The Willamette River Basin Task Force has transformed their report into a wonderful kids' curriculum. The kids' curriculum focuses on a group of native plant and animal characters that guide the children throughout the book on things that they can do to help improve the health of the Willamette watershed. Sarah and Tia here are modeling some of our Willamette Basin Task Force team t-shirts. If you'd like more information on the curriculum, on the Willamette River Basin Task Force report, Confluence Conference, or the Partners for a Clean Willamette, you can dial the 1-888-854-8377 that was generously donated by the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ron. Thank you, Carol. All right, Bridget Adolph, thank you very much. We do have something that we would like to present to Governor Kitzhaber. However, it's not actually for you. <laughs> That is, of course, for your son, Logan. Uh, I think the message we're trying to get across and the message that the task force wanted to present to you tonight, Governor, is that it is now the future is in the hands of the children, and we're hoping that we can do something now before it's too late so that what we leave them in terms of the Willamette River Basin will be something that they can indeed use. For Larry Shoup, Joe Donlin, and John Catton, I'm Carol Jensen. I'd like to thank everybody here in our audience as well as those of you viewers at home for watching tonight the Willamette River Basin Currents of Change. Thank you for joining us. This Willamette River special broadcast and community discussion were proudly sponsored by Portland General Electric, connecting people, power, and possibilities. Every time it rains, even a little bit, pollution from our neighborhoods washes into our rivers. That's why clean rivers start at home, and it's easy to do your part. Keep your driveway and sidewalk clean by sweeping instead of hosing them down. Perform regular maintenance on your car to prevent oil and coolant leaks. And put cigarette butts in their proper place, not on the ground. Portland General Electric urges you to save the drain for the rain because clean rivers start with you. This is the world of the Northwest. A place that can give a person a different perspective, a whole different way of looking at things and where every day, News Channel 8 shows you what in your world is going on. The who, what, when, and where, and how and why it matters to perceptive people who live here. The events and the consequences. You watch, you'll see.